And it was only eight, 600 fast food joints. And there are more, I guess. And we realized that that on its own on a monthly basis, those guys are generating about 110, 24 million. <sighs> because we also run away from a gas it. We, we always, our aspiration, it's always to move out a gas completely because there is a trauma that we have as township guys that have grown up in these townships, right? Mm. So we are thinking differently now and we need to take up spaces. Uh, it is our responsibility as this generation to take up spaces. If we don't, we'll continue to perpetuate the fragmentation that exists. It's inherent. It's, if you look at how apartheid has composed township, they've already segregated us. ShopRite has just announced now, now, uh, two weeks ago, that they are launching 500 U-Safe stores across all townships. Ooh. They are reinventing the township completely. <laughs> So Tina, while because we are fighting the Pakistan, billion. yes, while we are fighting Pakistanis <laughs> that have organized themselves, unfortunately, fortunate enough. Welcome to another edition of Mindset Profits. It's another exciting day uh, because today we're talking township economy, the opportunity there, the hustlers that are there, the businesses that are growing from that economy to a higher level. Yeah. And I thought, let me look for the one person I know who is a, an authority in the space. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting here with Usri Sotewa. Yeah. He runs the township box shop mm. hub mm. in Fos Loras. So sure. you're talking to someone who is actively empowering other entrepreneurs in the township. Yeah. And welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much uh, for having me in the podcast today. <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan of mine. I know. We, we good. We're good to have you. Your family. Um, you were saying you, today you want to sit proper. Yes, I was told by one of your hosts <laughs> when I was watching some of your episodes. Uh, Her name is Doric. Yeah. And I was like, you need to sit straight and command. And, command and I'm like, and yo, <laughs> I've already been put into that. <laughs> so let me sit straight and command. But yeah. Um, quite happy to be here. Mm. Looking forward to the discussions around the township economy. Mm. Um, for me, I think it's always about keeping the narrative alive. Yeah, know, beautiful. And owning it, of course. Mm. Yeah. That's, a, that's a beautiful start. So, the funny thing, mm. I'm passionate about the sector, but I didn't know people that are that are knowledgeable yeah. about what's going on in the township. Mm -hmm. I did grow up in the township, but not as an entrepreneur, not even with the mindset. So it, okay. it never occurred to me that there's entrepreneurship going on around me. Yeah. I would just see people sailing in the street. And mm. it, uh, there's people that like doing that. Yeah. It never occurred to me, at least growing up, uh, that's entrepreneurship. It starts there, and for some people, it actually grows to something. Big. big yeah so in my passion i went and looked on radio mm. for someone who on their linkedin <laughs> profile yeah they are saying township economy accelerator mm. we call this guy comes good radio and man it was one of the worst interviews we've ever like had for real yeah we were sitting with co host <laughs> radio hope alive such all right man excited to talk about this township yeah. economy yeah. you say you are a leader in the space yeah. so tell us go accelerator how are you guys pulling it off yeah and he says oh you mean township economy oh that thing on my linkedin <laughs> so <laughs> on radio yeah on live. radio this is live yeah say so <laughs> yeah me and the boys one weekend we went and picked up some tires and <laughs> Sent them to a recycling thing, you know, so cleaning the township. <laughs> yeah. And then you put a profile. <laughs> and you know, you've been building this profile up, Gurejo, because you saw one statement and you thought, definitely, this is our person. Okay. I'm not saying it to say, yo, I hope we're not having <laughs> one of those. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, you're not having one of those. Because um, today I know. Yeah. I have had the pleasure of meeting you in a coaching platform, listening okay. to your insight and stuff. So I'm not worried. I'm actually excited to have you here. Okay. I'm quite excited also. Mm. Yeah. How did you get into the space? Um, 
It's a bit of a long story, but I'll keep it short. Mm. Um, born and brought up in the township, Soweto. Mm. Um, I've always had a curious mind, really about the fact that, uh, you know, what is the history of the township? Why are we here? Why there is borders that borders us, you know? Mm. If you look at Soweto, I mean, it is made up of uh, how many townships? About 45 townships. They make up Soweto. Yo. So it's funny that people think of Soweto as a lumped 2,000 square <laughs> meter of land, right? Gandhi, there is actually townships there that makes up Soweto, that consolidate that to make up one particular Big brand. Soweto. And, um, you know, growing up, I've always been curious, looking at why certain townships are composed. Actually, there's a culture or there's a norm that we see in how segregation and apartheid, basically, the special planning was, was kind of, you know, um, a belt, you know, okay. and how they can control, you know, black people and actually monitor their movement. So we, I actually looked at it and I said to myself, if I'm in Dobsonville, and in Dobsonville, as one single township, it is distributed in different cultures, you know? Okay. Uh, there is a section for Shangans, for Zulus, ETC. And I realized that it is only unique and special in Soweto. But if you look at other townships outside of Soweto, in areas like in Tanzania, you could see that there's a concentration of a single culture or a single kind of heritage that is there okay um so i grew up there i was i was conscious but i realized that soweto has its own dynamics it's quite an interesting space uh, you would meet a shangani guy a vendor you know a kosa a tswana and there will be a concoction of of language that comes out of that mm. and then through the concoction of language you then realize that structurally there has been the mom and pops store. That's what they call it in this modern language, but we call them mama general dealers. Yeah. There has been a prevalence of spaza shops. That's how we always saw I I I I ghetto. Yeah. But also there were style heroes that were championing a township economy like Abu Richard Maponya, Nobabu Shavalala, you know, who were owning, um, and they happened to be mayors, also some of them. So they were close to these opportunities in terms of the apartheid regime that can open up opportunities for them. Mm. And there was a prevalence of also these shops that we would see around, whether it's a butchery, whether, and they were handed over to families with the 99 year lease. So I've always looked at this composition of this economy and tried to look at it from a perspective of saying, okay, what do we have in terms of sectors? There are taxis, there is a retail, and there is this informal economy that we always talk about, that mm. it's uniquely placed in these taxi ranks and where you see Abu Mama Bapanda or ETC. Mm. But there's also these unique products that you can only find in the township, right? So for me, it was that at first where it was just a curiosity. But you know, as you grow up the ladder, you get into the academics and you really begin to realize that, hey man, why haven't we documented an experience of what the township economy is? Actually, what is the township economy? So I went to Pretoria to study animal science. I was a boy from Soweto and I went to concentrate <laughs> myself in an agricultural uh, uh, qualification, qualified as a scientist. Yeah. And then one time I was in East London and there was a gentleman who was saying to me, hey Baba, and it was during the consciousness era where we used to speak a lot about Abu Black Consciousness, I mean, Abu, mm. Abu Steve Biko. And the guy asked me to say, Eman, tell me what can you do with your qualification that can help you go back to the township and benefit the township? And that for me was the first spark. And I said, maybe I can go and start monitoring butcheries because the flow of meat that comes there and the quality of it, it's questionable. And there was also limitation of capacity by, you know, agents of government that were sitting in environmental, where their responsibility was to check all these mom and pop shops and the butcheries thereof. And I thought to myself, maybe there's an opportunity here for me to take my qualification and start doing my own monitoring in the space. And that's where the curiosity started to extensively really start studying the township. 
Okay. Um, how did this transition to you getting in involved with the hub and helping yeah. town township entrepreneurs? So fast forward, um, I get an opportunity to start a business. It's called Bravo Grilled Chicken. Uh, mm -hmm. Launched it in Protea uh, Mall, and I was selling chicken there. And that's where everything started. But it was just basically a perspective of saying, how do we clean up the township from formal and informal? How do we bring strong business ideas that are able to scale up and be franchisable? I mean, there's an organization called NAFCOC. I'm not sure whether you're familiar mm. with it. I mean, it was established in 1964. And uh, who was championing it? I mean, the Richard Maponias were on the forefront of it. The intention was simple. It was always about the township economy and its development. It has always been about ownership of our own economy. So I think they brought it in at the pertinent time because there was a boom of these malls that were coming out in the township. I mean, you know, your, your Maponya Mall, they were coming up. Um, if you look at other townships, there were other malls that were coming up. And there was, I think, a feel and a backlash uh, from, from intermediary organization in the township, such as NAFCOC and the BMF, Black Management Business Forum, to say, how do we allow malls to be seated here, but we don't own even a proportion or shareholding of the very same infrastructure that is there. But also it was a call, a cry to say, the mom and pop shops are dying. And these malls, I mean, if you look at BEE, B has opened up opportunities, yes, it is fair, but it has also killed certain economies and certain environment, right? Mm. So at us getting our freedom, you know, and at the at the height of 2005, 2007, during the Tabombegi Helm, Helm you realize that um, that's when there has been an aggressive, you know, a push of malls being planted in the township. But the question is, who is owning those malls and we realized that these are big property companies that own malls and also they bring their own kind of businesses and anchor tenants so if you look at where are the statistics now in terms of localization and local ownership in the township it has dwindled um, and 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 and, and the, the statistics are, show, are, are are actually shocking that so you're saying even after pee in terms of ownership in the townships we don't own our stuff that's where we witness the real yeah we don't own we don't we don't own unless we are talking about masingita that is a, a jablan <laughs> mall that is owned <laughs> by the masingita family and and some of these malls but if you look at it you know we don't really own these malls including maponya mall you know, it's part owned, you know, it's part owned by the family and it is part owned by the investors that put in money there. So it's 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 that quagmire that we see where the township is and why the intention of saying, guys, we can't allow this economy to, I mean, it's it's like we are not even playing in that space. We are not even role players in that space. You know, uh, these things are built in isolation of those that are role players in the space. But I don't want to blame ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's also a huge issue of fragmentation among intermediary organization. If you look at NAFCOC 1964, and if you look at it now, there hasn't been really much progress. I mean, it's still stuck, you know, on the first mandate. So we may for me, it means that we have a leadership deficit within these economical sectors or within these environments where there are no new guys who want to take on the baton and say, how do we continuously address these issues that we have with this economy? Because it is dubbed as a gold mine. It's a 900 billion rand economy nationally. If you look at the FMCG market, it's about 150 billion. The informal sector. All about sectors put billion. together. Yeah, not all sectors put together. Yeah, all sectors put together. It's about 900 billion, but the biggest contributor is the FMCG sectors, which is the retail environment that sits around 150 billion. But we are not factoring in the informal market that also contributes a sizable amount of billions in the market, but we still are not owning even the value chain. You know, so. We call ourselves glorified retailer, <laughs> retailers because even an outlet that sells alcohol, there's no ownership of the product itself. I mean, we are just a conduit 
to perpetrate <laughs> products <laughs> of those that that are big corporates that uh, that basically uh, you know at, at SAP I mean if you look at SAP statistics on annually on the consumption of alcohol you know you you see that uh, you know townships are, are the biggest contributors and and they've kept that market alive and you if you look at SAP they've they've invested quite a lot in the township economy from a perspective of developing these retailers as their distribution uh, um, um, partners you know I guess that's a good thing yeah but all right so if you are you are making my mind all over the place because you're saying nine billion and I'm trying nine hundred billion nine nine hundred billion nine billion nine hundred billion I'm trying to process it yeah nine hundred billion mm -hmm. and we don't own much of that yeah what do you think should change I think we need a lot of think tanks in the township. Um, we need to feed from those that have walked the mile and recognize them. And I don't think that we are recognizing them. And I'll make a simple example. I mean, if you look at Uma Morita, um, um, the founder of Shisanyama, and also you look at Tusakumzi, you know, um, you're looking at guys that have taken over as kind of a second generation of entrepreneurs, you know. Um, okay. And they've kind of created a solid business and that has stood the test of time and that has grown in that market over time and these are people that we need to have as our think tankers you know put in a team of think tankers who will sit and who will discuss how the future of the township should look like of course we cannot reverse what has currently been happening i mean guys have invested a sizable amount of money in developing malls etc but how do we begin to have meaningful conversation with them around the idea of saying, guys, we need to promote what we call ownership here. And if we have to educate our people, how do we begin to educate our people about them beginning to play a meaningful role as active citizen in this economy? There should be a strong educational drive, I think, from government since there is a Township Economy Development Act that has been enacted, I think, back in 2022. The act for me, it's the biggest weapon and it's the biggest win that basically brings the township economy and put it in the spotlight. So there is a think tank that needs to come up. There are institutions like GIPS that are already investing in some research papers that I think can help us to sit in this think tank and help us reconfigure the business models that are already existing in the township to see how can we scale, how can we replicate them. I, I like what you're saying about the think tank and having conversations with those that have gone ahead of us mm. and become actually successful. And I thought, actually, I have Sakumzi's number. I never thought to call him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I should call I, him here, actually. I actually work with Sakumzi very closely. Um, Is it? Is one of the businesses that I um, so one of my other hats is it's being a venture builder, so I help to reconfigure ventures um, and help them to scale. So currently, most recently, Sakumzi is, is a scaled up his business. I mean, he now has three outlets. Oh, I, I just know he's the actually one. And I love the food, over man. Zoo, Zoo Lake. You know, Zoo Lake where Moyos was, like my selling. Now there's Sakumzi there. Right. Sakumzi, if you're watching this one, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> now I can organize for you to, to share. I mean, he shares a, a sentiment. I mean, you know, that's why I'm saying Sakumzi has championed the township economy from a tourism perspective. I mean, you know, we've got guys like Abu Kulane Vilagazi that also have been champion of the very same economy. But if you look at how they've kind of built that precinct uh, and how they were able to entice tourists to come to, 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 to Soweto, for me, I feel like the think tank, and it's something that I'm working on, so I'm, I'm going to kind of confess, there is, a, there is a, a kind of a movement or an agency that I've put together. It's called the Brand Township. It's like Brand South Africa. Okay. We need to protect our narrative. Our narrative, if it's skewed, it does not show off, you know, guys like Abu Sakumzi. There's a gentleman that owns Five Star, um, a car wash in Soweto, and many of them 
who basically started their business, you know, with a bucket and uh, Iskoro bought wash, you know, cars from cars. He drove taxis from taxis. Now he owns multiple properties. He has a five-star car wash. He's self-made. And you realize that the resilience of a township entrepreneur that is able to be self-made and build is something that we can learn. And how do we basically bring those stories back? Because another thing my concern is, uh, is and why I choose the route of research, knowledge management, is because if Sakumzi drops dead tomorrow, how do we preserve his story? How do we extract so much from him around the learnings and the lessons that we have there? That, that through his experience and through this intergenerational transition where you saw 1994, 2000, and now mm-hmm. 2024, how has he been able to keep his business alive? Nabu Mamrita. So, Nabu Mamrita. Mm-hmm. You know, Mamrita has even written a couple of books for entrepreneurs. She's championing the retail conversation around malls in the township. That's why there's a strong move around, you know, a, a think tank, bringing all these stalwarts into one room and say, Buffett, Stellanis leading. I think that's why you got yourself into that trouble of a guy or Mataira. Yeah, hey, no, that got me good. That got me good. No, I got Mamrita, I'll let you jump in there. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll also talk to Mamrita. I have a close relationship. Hey, there. we are hooked up. <laughs> we are connected up in here. <laughs> so, so for me, if you look at, at, at how Abu Sakums has championed that, what can we learn from those models? If Villagas works in Soweto, there is an opportunity for a prison to be built in City Bank, mm-hmm. in Sosha, and, and these things have been built. They are just informal. I mean, there's a Czech Buddha that is in Mami Lodi. Yeah. And if you look at that strip, there is a new development of businesses and mixed retail that is mm. there. It's not formalized, but it is there. It's there, yeah. You go to Deep Proof, there's a, sp- a street called Mink. In, in it, it borders between Deep Proof Zone 3 and Deep Proof Zone 4. It's a long street that takes you from, I think, from the M1 on the other side, also way to highway. And you can drive all the way to... A bar, but there are strips of restaurants and activities in that space. So that's what we are trying to do with Fosloras and with the digital hub. Where we are placed, it's a precinct environment, and we want to convert that space into what we call the Fosloras Boulevard. It's an enterprise zone slash um, a township precinct. And if we could be able to ignite these spaces and create destinations out of township so that when you are in Morningside and you feel like you want to go to Foslo, you don't have to think a lot but there is a destination where you can go to and you are comfortable to even bring some of the peers and the colleagues and the constituencies that you have to begin to support you know, the ecosystem so we need to build ecosystem that's how the future of townships for me look like no that's beautiful man i'll, I'll come check out the hub valley yeah i need to shoot something there yeah i'm gonna tell you it's um mm. quite a number of years it's mm. pretty view oh okay okay yeah so yeah. i yeah i'm i'm pretty cool yeah <laughs> oh, <I'm one. laughs> yeah all right so when you look at your research you look at your findings and the connects that you've had mm. what would you say are the unique challenges that a township entrepreneur faces i think one of the biggest challenge is access mm-hmm. uh, and access to key and important information and mm. sector based um information uh, information Okay. And I'm talking on the basis that in my study, one of the findings that I did was that we undertook um, a database of about 800 businesses that are in Soweto. And when we analyzed the data, we looked at that 60% of those businesses were in the food space. And then we did our own calculation because, yes, these numbers are thrown. 900 billion, 300 billion, 150 <laughs> billion, right? And we kind of like, let's zoom in into a granular number so that we can be able to be satisfied ourselves. And it was only eight, 600 fast food joints, and there are more, I guess. And we realized that that on its own, on a monthly basis, those guys are generating about 110, 24 million. 
combined. Yeah, no, no, I get you. You look at the car wash sector, it's about 90 million. So those are the findings that I got through just a sample group that I had and through talking to other intermediary organizations. So it tells only a so way to Anga Pegi e Mamilo di Tembisa. I did a recent study also now on backyard rental and small scale rental. The value is about 10 billion. There's already property companies that are investing in the technology to reinvent that uh, that sector. Guys like Room King, mm. you know, uh, Nabu Amarum, right? It's a big market for them. And 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 if you look at Amarum, they were built like ish. Ubonga nuyas dinendlini. It is a kila Amarum uyashalanga pamba. That has been what is happening. Mm. And and then the generation grow and Ubongani mm. either uyashalendlini or Ubongani moves out, then the rooms are left vacant. Then there is a flood of people that wants to stay in Makas uh, because of it's affordable, things are not that expensive, and they now start occupying these rooms. Now, if you look at the competitive prices of how these rooms are composed, I mean, in Soweto, you can catch an average of about 3,500 on the new you know, rooms that are, are renovated, bachelors. Mm. But if you go to Tembisa, it's about 5,500 rand. Right? So you're realizing that, that the sector is actually now beginning to become a big sector. I mean, it's 10 billion now, and guys like Abu Tev, like Abu Mastandi, like Abu um, Kasi for Real, they are beginning to invest a sizable amount of money in supporting enterprises and entrepreneurs in the township. So for me now, sector-based approach. Sector-based information is lacking. Sector-based information, sector-based funding, sector-based ah. insights, aggregation, collaboration, all these things, they are very important for us to be able to drive the narrative. And fragmentation is our biggest problem. I mean, everyone is trying to do his own thing. So brand townships kind of a unifier brand that I want to bring to say, guys, we are having multiple conversation. And it's like we are inherent of this, how black people operate, where but if we could be able to share resources and share our own knowledge and connect, we can be able to streamline and build our own value chain. And, and that is possible. But we just have to make sure that we have a different mind shift and thinking. Hence, research papers, insight papers, and own them so that we don't serve an agenda. We serve our own agenda. And I mean, the recent, uh, my white paper called the Township Jive, uh, Insiders Insights, it's that let's share our own insights. Tina is insiders. We sit here. Mm -hmm. We analyze the sectors and we, we share our own insight. I want to make kind of a simple example. Look at the funeral sector. The funeral sector, we kind of in on it via value chain because we are there in the tombstone, you know, the manufacturing of boxes, <laughs> the fleet of cars, ETC, you know. And then you realize that there are now an emergence of new sectors there. And I like talking about these two things that are phenomenal. Which are grave trackers and grave diggers. Oh. Right? So I'll give you a bit of, of, of information. No, educate so, me. So grave trackers, because Soweto is one of the oldest township, I mean, 1913, around there, 1930, first mm. occupation, I say, Orlando East, there has been Amatuna, you know, cemeteries around. Um, and you ask a marriage there to us black people during the Easter or any time you yeah. want to go into your granny's grave or great granny's grave or your shweleza. But there's no tombstone, ni wheelie, So the grave trackers basically are always at the entry point of a symmetry like in um conje in the cemetery famous uh, I'll, I'll remember it. It's around the area of Abulens, uh, Lenasia, borderline between okay. the, yeah. So so you'll see them waiting there. And the Mongena, they have they have shovels and they say, hey, Rotman, hey, who are you looking for? It's like, ish, so she leza patang maza buti falegi uwe nyaz buti ula la 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 la. And they say, okay, we can track it for you. You give them the number. 
they go ahead of you and they find that grave and they say, here's your grave and you pay them 40 rand, 50 bucks, 20 bucks and they say, can we clean for you as a value add? You pay them an additional 40 bucks. So these guys, they generate almost 350 to 400 rand on a daily basis. That's, oh. a sec- that's a sector. These guys are entrepreneurial. This is what they are actually doing. And then grave closures are those that says, Eish, I'm a chita was a funuk shay haraf, was kabangana na mai neke ni ori samti. So these guys basically offer a service to say, you pay me 200 bucks or 300 bucks, even a thousand bucks, and they will close a grave for you and they'll make sure that it is neat and it is fine. So those are t- sectors that we are not talking about. I mean, another, you know, finding in the study when I talk about the funeral sector is understanding what are the challenges. So the biggest challenge is that these guys, they don't have mosheries. So they, 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 they actually rent out mosheries from each other to say, I've got a body. Are you able to store this for me? And I'll come and collect it this day because I need to save this, right? So imagine if there was a singular, one big mochari Mochari. business model that can accommodate everyone and everyone can own a particular cubicle or a portion. Or, and then we rent it out to them. Or just rent space yeah, as and when it is. Sa- same as space, um, these space companies, you can yeah. do the same for them. There's a huge need of luxury cars in the sector. There is a convergence of Abu, the existing car rental companies where they can look at luxury and begin to rent out these luxury vehicles for you know when they have to drive to cemetery and come back with the family because at this current moment the one that has a, a mercedes benz an suv a what what they borrow each other they just change the stickers so there's already a culture of working together in that sector and there's already a culture or there's already opportunities that can open up for other business models to thrive so for me that, those are kind of thinking patterns that one is having around reconfiguring sectors, strengthening them, and making sure that we create a seamless, a seamless kind of business models where the opportunity then opens up other opportunities for us to integrate technology and make sure that we create a, flu, a fluid and flowy, you know, operational systems for those businesses. All right, so when you're talking about some of the challenges, I like that you're saying there's some collaboration that you see with yeah. changing of cars and mm. swapping stickers. That That is good. Mm. When I normally think about us black people, and I want you to correct me if this is wrong, because yeah. you've done research, and this is not research-based. Mm. It's based on watching me and neighbors. Observation. Yes. Yeah. We struggle to work with each other. Mm. We struggle to collaborate, we struggle to trust each other. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the few people that are kind enough to trust the next brother get messed up mm. in a service delivery. Mm. <laughs> how how does that change? Because it's a huge if it exists and it's as real as I believe it is, mm. it's a huge obstacle to the great vision that you have of one voice, a mm. township. If we are used to and sometimes feel better off just pushing our own thing. There should be a new voice. For me, now that's that's the best answer I can give you. We mm. we we are thinking differently now, and we need to take up spaces. Uh, it is our responsibility as this generation to take up spaces. If we don't, we'll continue to perpetuate the fragmentation that exists. It's inherent. It's if you look at how apartheid has composed township, they've already segregated us already. So for us to kind of change our mindset, it's something that is imprinted in our thinking. And for me, I think in this generation and, and this generation, because we also run away from it. We we always our aspiration it's always to move out Ekasi completely because there is a trauma that we have as township guys that have grown up in these townships, right? Mm. So this is not a, a silver bullet kind of solution. There isn't really any solution. I think there should be some patience among ourselves. Okay. And there should be an intention for us to be able to collaborate intentionally and collaborate um, 
for one common cause. I mean, we've done it before. We've collaborated in fighting against the system. Mm. The new plight is poverty. The new light is the economy emancipation. We need to focus our minds around that. The egos of the oldies, because we are experiencing this with the egos of the oldies, right? Patala, Obananga Zongjela, there's history. And if we feed into that narrative, there's nothing that we can change. So for me now, I hang around the Sakums, I hang around Urit, I hang around the stalwarts that have done it. Abu Babu Twala, Abu Babu Sipo Gaza, you know, the guys that are basically championing the township economy. And I'm beginning to understand when I'm sitting there to say, for the, the only way to change the mentality is to bring yourself closer to those that are leading the revolution, if it is a revolution. Mm. And beginning to understand, to say, guys, why are we fragmented? Why, why are we not moving in this direction? And you'll begin to realize that there are weaknesses that can be closed by other institutions for us to thrive. Because if we don't protect this economy from a beneficiation perspective, it will be all lost. And I'll make a simple example. Yeah. ShopRite has just announced now, now, uh, two weeks ago, that they are launching 500 you safe stores across all townships. Ooh. They are reinventing the township completely. They are taking <laughs> it. And then at the back of it, three months ago, they, they launched a, a wholesale, a DC, an online DC that says, if you are a sponsor owner, you can stock from us and then we can deliver. So they've already positioned themselves in that market and they want to make sure that they reinvent that market. So Tina, while because we are fighting the Pakistan, billion. Yes. While we are fighting Pakistanis that have <laughs> organized themselves and uh, fortunate enough, um, we find ourselves exposed um, and we find ourselves complaining. And for me, I think it's not about taking sides. It's not about, it's about guys, we need a unifying voice. And we need to make sure that we begin to implement. We, we leverage on our, each other's capacity, our strength, and we are able to make sure that we position ourselves better into making sure that we reflect a positive image and, and a positive approach and progress and implementation of, how, uh, of township programs that will unlock further opportunities in ECAS. So for me, that's the thinking. I, I actually wonder what the programs would look like because yeah. I feel like there's a lot of training going on already. Mm. So I'm curious to see what this new training program has to focus on. What message comes out when you talk, hang around Bosa Kumzi Naorita and all the other stalwarts? What would they say we need to be educated on? We are not participating. They, that's what they say. They say, guys, you are not participating. And, and one of some kind of not resistant but concern is that we sit back and we allow those that come from the outside to write about what they see with no thorough understanding of the characteristics of this environment called the township economy. And, and it's about time that we should stop sitting at the back. So for Bona, they are worried and they are concerned. They are saying, hey, my chance, Nilale good. And Atina, we have done our part, but we can't impart the knowledge because everyone is sitting in their own corner. They are concerned about... There's no platform. About, there's no, you know? And Abona, they are quite open. We just have to reach out to them and basically be present and capture their store and capture their knowledge and understand what, how they've navigated. So I think we have been desensitized to look at the township as this poverty plaque where everyone that... Are, so, so we, we already have preconceived thought of what the township is. And that's why those that come from the outside, they see it and they're like, what a gold mine. What's going on here? You know? <laughs> and, and Tina, what has been imprinted in our mind is to say, I need to run away from this hellhole. That's, that's how we think. So let's bring ourselves closer to these guys let's let's make sure that we are accessible we are available let's be intentional about our narrative if the narrative is the township economy we have capabilities we have capacity we can rethink these models and for Bona, it's as simple as 
Um, guys who have built, you guys are playing far and you guys are not asking questions. And, and even if you are asking questions, you are not asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. And I think eating tank, it's central to everything for me. You know, we need thinkers. We need people that can think to build this economy. We need to be solutionist thinkers also. Um, and and I think we are blocked by complainers most recently in the township. Everyone is thinking, yeah, Ubani Wenze, Ubani Uze Wainzan. Well, those <laughs> that <laughs> are corporate, they are actually looking at you and they are thinking to themselves, ah, we are continuing. Keep complaining. I mean, let's talk a brief about the Pakistan. Yeah. The ratio is five is to one. So it means that for a block a gas, there are five spazas that are owned by Pakistanis to one locally owned. Ooh. If you ask a spaza owner, why? They'll tell you that our kids that we took to school and we wanted to educate them as lawyers and accountant ETC, they are looking at us and like, ah, you don't have a business here. I don't have time for this. So there's not even a succession plan. So they are left wanting and either they have an option to close or to rent it out to a Pakistani, or basically, you know, not have this puzzle operating. And that's what has happened. So we, not, we need to reverse such things because it looked like as puzzle, it was not something that was, that was fashionable. Mm -hmm. uh, last time, you know, I was in my small research, um, I realized that this puzzle uh, generated an average of about 3,500 rand a day. Think about over that's 30 days. Decent. 70% of that money will go to stock, of course, but they are left with 30%. People mm. have built their homes using this puzzle. Interestingly, there is a, a gambling. Before we paid, we don't get any markers. There is a, a gambling um, a culture that happened a long time ago, and it's still prevalent even today in the townships that are quite small, like Abu White City and and some spaces in in in, in the Katoras area, it is, and and it's called uh, Um China, mm. <laughs> where you dream of numbers, you put in uh, <laughs> two rand, <laughs> and you you earn fifty rand or a hundred rand. People have built homes with such gambling. And they have, it, it gave them an opportunity to, to bring a minimum investment of even one rand. If you win, you win 100 rand. If you mm -hmm. punch maybe six numbers, you might win 300 rand. And people have built their homes, they've invested their home, they've taken care of their homes. So there is that kind of appreciation of the things that we are doing. I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel. For me, we just have to bolster what's already happening and basically begin to try to build business models not and for me formalization does not mean compliance it means building a business model that works for the sector and that allows it to scale or you can repurpose a sector to continue scaling or to continue operating in this environment that's all that is some deep education what's your take on what's your take on the stockwell side of things the stock firm, it's huge in the township. It is huge. Not Do you see only. it as a missed opportunity or a good initiative that's helping and developing people? It's a good initiative. Mm -hmm. um, there is everything about it that's positive. Okay. Um, there's new investment that has gone into it. I mean, Tsepo Moloi um, has built an app called Stockfeller. And he has seen the need that what makes Stockfell to not be able to sustain themselves is that they are not centralizing their operation. So he came with the technology uh, because there's a bit of a lot of trust there. You know, if Mali, Mali, next month, but everything is based on trust, right? Also, the, the township economic environment it is based on trust. But I think it's a universal thing where business is about trust. So Tsepo Moloi has done that investment, and I think uh, through that, and he has stayed in it. I mean, he has stayed for the longest time, and he's increased the portfolio of stock fails, and we have seen diversification now of stock fails, that the stock fails have evolved from Mokshaila Animali to now 
closer in a December to now property stock fair, right? And these guys are building valuable assets uh, in terms of equity. And this valuable equity, once they've built it to a sizable amount, uh, they then look at what can we invest on. I mean, there was a nice stock fell back in 2020, which was done by a gentleman called Silebu Gile, mm-hmm. uh, and Tsepo, and another gentleman called Pakiso. I think these guys have done something amazing. Um, and I want to talk about it quickly now, because what they did, they aggregated the monies, yeah, they were able to raise about a million or two million rent. So they were the facilitators of all of that through a stock fell model, mm-hmm. and then they will they will buy franchise. So one of the franchise through this model was Jimmy franchise. Okay, the the the, the prawns and yeah yeah. So it was Jimmy franchise, and they open up one in uh, uh, Midlands, and I think they did another one in the in the, in some in, in some suburb. Okay, and and. And that was achieved through a Stockfell model. They tested it out. It's just that, you know, we don't write about these things. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's a it's a role of academia. You know, for me, I'm kind of feel blessed that I have an ability of a, being a writer as an academia and being an entrepreneur and implement on the ground. Mm-hmm. That was a perfect model. If we could sit with those guys and say, what did you learn from this? And take all the learnings and look at the risk and say to ourselves, now let's reconfigure. So I said to them when I was talking to them, because the idea is if you learn, if you own these jimmies, and then you are able to then infiltrate the value chain through black farmers to supply the value chain, that means you are beginning to own outlets and also own the value chain at the same time. And it becomes a kind of a feasible business model. That's what they wanted to do. And I said to them when I met up with them, and I said, you know what? There's a brand called Lokshin Chicken. Um, it's also now, it has grown outside of Isowetu, but in Soweto, it is an informal franchise model. And they sell chicken there. Like, they sell a simple meal for 40 bucks. Ne? Mm-hmm. Their ingredients are very simple. So, to set up that outlet, and it's not fancy, to set up that outlet probably might be about 200,000 rand if you okay. get all the equipment. So imagine if that one million that bought you one Jimmy could have bought you five of these. And that's the concept of what I say, township to township trade. Because then these guys, they own now five Jimmys. Uh, they own five Lokshin chickens. Mm. With five Lokshin chickens, they can then go to Social Uwe and say, guys, do you have a stock fell? Is there an opportunity that we can extend the very same chicken business into Social Uwe? We plan. And they would have built a franchise model that is solid, would have integrated or incorporated our farmers and our black farmers to be the suppliers of these chicken products and any other products that is there. And and for us, if you could look at what is the biggest challenge in the FMCG sector, we have black products, but they cannot get the market. And and it is also the solution sits with us. So that's why I'm saying we need to be intentional about everything that we do as a people so that we can be able to advance ourselves into the next stage of what does this ownership of the township economy means. Okay. Yeah. What, what does you, what's your answer to someone who says, a township entrepreneur who says, I don't have a chance because of the level where the competition is at? Mm-hmm. Because you're already talking about ShopRite coming in and mm. the financial muscle they have for me to compete with them, it's a non-starter. Mm-hmm. Or the Pakistanis you mentioned, they are already organized mm. starting and competing with them. Or any other sector where a big company has seen the opportunity mm. and put an establishment, a mm. Mm. for me to compete with them. When I'm starting, I don't have the financial muscle. To try, what's what's your answer to that entrepreneur who's discouraged to start and and grow because they believe the opportunity to grow and scale is limited because the competition has seen the same opportunity they are going after. I think central to any entrepreneurship uh, or any entrepreneur for them to develop it's it's what we are actually doing now: coaching and mentoring. Mm-hmm. Um, entrepreneurs need to have access, you know, dot partners. Um, 
And for me, I think um, I'll give you a simple model. Most recently, um, recognizing the sector of the retail of spas. We've been chatting to um, spa group. And spa, if you look at their values, their mission, they, they, are, they are collaborative by nature. They, they always talk about shared value. That is their interest. So we have to have this strategic collaboration with such corporations that in their values, they believe in shared opportunities, right? Okay. So we need to push guys like your ShopRite or like your YouSave and say to them, guys, yes, you have 500, but why aren't you not allowing us to organize ourselves so that we can supply a archer, a millimil. So there's always an opportunity for us to be suppliers of the value chain and participate there because we know that we cannot compete from an outlet perspective. So we need to use the Township Economy Development Act. I'm going to say to people, go and read that document. That document was not designed for <laughs> policy, for practitioners. It was designed for you. And if we take that policy and use it to our advantage to say we're going to force you as builder's warehouse or as whatever cash build or even shop right and force you to procure a percentage of your products from township entrepreneurs that will make will be a game changer because it will help us to organize ourselves. We'll sit in the value chain. And we know when we say to government, please invest on a factory, Yamazambane, for example, because there are guys that are actually doing frozen potatoes. potatoes. Yes, I, I know guys that are doing a lot of products. And if we can be able to, to do that and be able to give these guys an opportunity to have volumes, and enter these markets and enter this retail. For me, I think it's a fighting chance that we have. The second advice for me is a Sengshilo, your mentorship, your thought partner, if we put it that way, you need to have those people around you. But also we need to be business safe. We need to think about what are the business models that can help us to thrive. So my conversation with SPA is around creating a model called SPAZA. SPA? Yeah. yeah. So it's a hybrid model that has um, a bit of a, a combination of things. I don't want to kind of disclose yeah, yeah. these things now. But they are coming with good intention. And the narrative is simple. We are not coming there or we are not going to them and say, listen, you have this concept. Uh, uh, I think we can, we can set you up. We kind of say, guys, you are coming in an environment where there's existing puzzles. How do we work with those puzzles? to create a meaningful impact to them? How do we make sure that we make them competitive, we give them value, we, we give them competitive advantage against what they have challenges on? And I think if we can use the same principle, we can even go to Amma Pakistan and say, guys, we can't take you away, we can't chase you away, you have invested in this township, but let's look at what you have in your shelves. How do we get ourselves into the shelves and have a proportion of township products to sit on those shelves and start selling them into the market? For me, that's what I see currently. Um, All right, so really being I, see, I see the value of that conversation, but who is going to have that conversation? Is it someone advocating for small businesses, speaking to all these role players mm. or the individual entrepreneur? Because as an brand individual, township. it's hard. It's brand township. So, so for me, intermediaries are aggregators. They sit with this database. They sit with these entrepreneurs. They know who's doing what where. And that idea needs to have a, a kind of a, a top-down approach, yeah. right? Because they started with the you know, um, bottom-up, because they started on the ground to mobilize. Now where they are stuck is to pivot, to say what is next? What is next from this aggregation? Do we simply leverage on, we want 500 entrepreneurs from the township, we want to support them and train them, or do we change the conversation completely and say, guys, we understand the empowering element, but now these are the real challenges that we are facing. 
how do we begin to work towards that? And one of the guys that I think they are doing that and they're disrupting, it's a company called Family Tree. It's an intermediary that was appointed by the Gauteng Economical Development. And what they've done most recently, they have what we call Minoto Fund, and they are focusing on creating DCs um, that are owned by Spaza owners um, that can aggregate the stock and be able to deploy it to them, even on credit and other benefits that are there. So small beginnings. We need to start small. Um, this elephant is very big, and okay. we can't chow it all at once. We can just start small. So the guys need to look at who's the intermediary that they can be close to, how do they join in to be part of the intermediary, and they can get access of mentors, access of support, access of opportunities. You can't operate in isolation. There's no way that you will grow. If you sit alone wherever that you are sitting, there's no way that you can be able to mm. really make a serious impact as an entrepreneur. All right, so as we keep it off, uh, yeah. because you have to go to the other interview. Hey, she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what is your word of advice or message to young people growing in the township right now? Because um, I told you where I started. I grew up in the township and uh, believe me, mm. it was happening around me and it mm. never occurred. That yeah. This is business and I could be a role player and this. Mm. It was just like, oh, oh well, Banya is one Spaza. It's all just uh, going on. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a special quote I got from a lady called Trudy McKay. Yeah. Um, and, and she said something that was important. And she said, if we don't collaborate, we will eventually evaporate. We'll, we'll be non-existent <laughs> in the marketplace. So we have to collaborate. Central to everything that we do now. It's a collective effort. I mean, if we look at economies like, you know, uh, China, India, I mean, India is now a tech, you know, hub. China, their biggest manufacturer of technology, anything that you see, anything, it's manufactured by them. There is a collaborative effort among them. You know, there is no inherent of egos. There's, there's an intention that is there. So for me, it starts in your own hood. It starts you walking to a quarter lady and saying, where do you buy your cheese? Where do we do this? Why can't we just sit together so that we can start reducing our cost? How do we buy stock in advance and keep it somewhere? So there should be intention. Without no intention, without no collaboration, we're going to evaporate completely and and we're not going to write this story. The story is going to be different in the next 20 years. So we need to think with an end in mind. We always have to think about, and, and that's why I, say, I like encouraging thinking, because mm -hmm. without thinking, and without us thinking and coming together, we can't put plans together. So we need to have kind of a roadmap that is realistic, that is 20 years, and that says, how do we change the status quo and how do we bring those that are becoming champion to drive their agenda and make sure that we change the, the current you know, uh, status of what the township looks like and what the township economy is now, written by those who favor and, and an ability to, for them to, to be able to put their products there and push their own agenda. So we need to okay. own some kind of our agendas. Beautiful. Are there books that you recommend for township entrepreneurs specifically? Um, I have a white paper that I can recommend oh, called they, The Township they, Jive. They read your paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I encourage that. There's a recent uh, book that has been published. I, I forgot the name of the author, but I'll, I'll send you the link. It's a gentleman, uh, a star lord, that has wrote about those that have contributed in the development of the township economy. So he writes a story about Maponya, uh, Mr. Shabalala, and a lot of them. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, he talks about the great things that they have done. Um, so for us to be able to, to move ahead, we always have to reflect and read um you know what the guys have done and that have worked because the circumstances that they were at they were very challenging yeah. and these guys have been able to push you know against the tide so for me uh i'll share the the book um Please. and then yeah 
you know, young people yeah, need to read it. If there's one thing I'm not stingy with is promoting any material of other people. Yeah. So we can just pop in the link. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't I'll, even I'll need pop in the link from it. It's gonna, if it's going to help someone out there. Yeah. Let's now I'll pop it. in the link. Uh, we need to be inspired. Uh, we need to know what's out there. We need to read our own content. Uh, of course, there's a Gigi book called Gasinomics. It's a great start, right? Because it gives you a bit of an insight uh, around value of certain sectors, what is happening. And there is a bit of scalability there. So uh, the, the, the white paper, it's, it's there for intermediaries, those that are already supporting enterprises. And, and that is the paper that people should read because it's a very, it's a deep dive. It has granular information. It talks about the act. It talks about the utopia of various sectors. And um, it will help. Is it is a link available for it? Yeah, it is. There is ah, available. So we'll I'll, share, I'll well. share the link. Uh, so we have a couple of links. Out. Yeah. yeah. Man, it's uh, been good. I, I'll share the link. It's been good to have you. Yeah. Some education, yeah, you make me reflect quite <laughs> a lot. Yes, nothing is born out growing up in so many opportunities I was missing out on. But this is good. Yeah. Thank you for hanging with us till this time. He has to dash off, but we will pop in all the links that we mentioned. And if you are listening somewhere halfway in the episode, there yeah. were a few names dropped yeah. that are going to be coming. So mm. if you want to learn from those that have grown their businesses and scaled in the township mm -hmm. to the point of writing books, mm -hmm. they are coming. Yeah. Uh, See uh, you in the next episode. Shop, shop. <laughs>